Hello, uh, welcome to this afternoon's session on post elections. This is the post November 2016 elections. What are the challenges and opportunities? This will be the continuation of the uh, opening remarks of the Marxist Strategy and Tactics Weekend afternoon session of 2 18 2017. I'd like to start with uh, a refresher of what is, uh, what is Marxist strategy and tactics. First of all, Marxism is a method of scientific critical thinking whose main components include dialectical materialism, that is the philosophical portion of it, political economy, and then scientific socialism. So the starting point for Marxist strategy and tactics starts with objective reality, truth from facts. What changes are occurring? What are the main contradictions driving social change? As Marx said, the objective is not only to interpret the world, but to change it. What comes next? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? So what are strategy and tactics? Uh, strategy and tactics, uh, in a nutshell, is long-term plans versus planned tasks to implement these long-term plans. It, it includes methods and means in the class struggle based on a Marxist analysis and their purpose to meet the challenges and opportunities in this new Trump era and beyond. So before we can start an analysis, we really need to understand where we we're at, what, what was happening, what has been happening up to the present period. So uh, why don't we start with the financial and political crisis of global neoliberalist capitalism. So today we have a neo-fascist as president of the United States. Trump and EU neo-fascists are right in the discontent over the intensification of capitalist exploitation, currently called global neoliberalism, that includes deindustrialization and lost manufacturing jobs, lower wages and benefits, greater economic inequality, and economic stagnation. Trump lies is to the cause, scapegoating immigrants and people of color, Muslims, Mexico, China, etc. Trump lies about ISIS solutions based on nationalism, trust me, and offers more unfettered neoliberal capitalism. So as a refresher, we need to understand what, what is neoliberalism? And basically it's a self-serving racket. Uh, it is raw, greedy, unconstrained, unregulated global capitalism also called neoliberal imperialism, plain, unchecked market fundamentalism, main components of which are lower taxes on corporations and the wealthy, privatization of public resources and services, cuts in social spending, fiscal austerity programs, slow collapse of public health and education, research in child poverty, attacks on pensions. This is all manifestations of, of, of social, lower social spending. What is its purpose? Basically, cut back cut taxes on the corporations and increase profits. They're also scrapping regulations on corporations, including union rights, investment banking, environment, worker safety, consumer protection, offshore manufacturing to low wage countries, private now wages in this country, international trade agreements that increase profits for multinational corporations. Think about the TPP, think about NAFTA, and the other trade agreements. Uh, reduced it, this agreements, international agreements, they, they, call it, they also call it globalization, is to reduce national sovereignty, lower labor standards, undermine labor unions, and collective bargaining worldwide. So the question is, why, why was this new global neoliberal policy, why did it take place? Um, and this was deliberate. This, 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 this didn't happen as an accident. This was planned, okay? And that was because there was a down, downward spiral of diminishing returns for capitalism in the 1970s. You know, Marx has predicted that this is basic contradiction of capitalism. And that is uh, basically over you know, over, overproduction, underconsumption, leading to diminishing returns on capital. So the capitalist class had to adjust to this. So what they did is they scrapped the New Deal compromises between labor and capital forged back in the 1930s and the growing militant labor and communist movement resulting from the depression. 
So the result of the, the depression not only created an economic crisis, it also created a militant labor movement. And they had to deal with that. Uh, they had to deal with the growing influence of Soviet socialism back in the late, uh, late 30s. Um, not only in the United States, but all over the world. And the need for a united front in the global war against fascism. So they knew they were going to go to war against Nazi Germany, Italy, you know, Italian fascism, and, and the Japanese. So they had to have a deal. And this was called the New Deal. This is Roosevelt's New Deal. So that deal worked out pretty good for several, several decades, right, until the 70s. So neoliberalism started in the 70s, but really took off in the 1980s under Reagan, Thatcher in the United Kingdom, and later under Bill Clinton. So Bill Clinton, in that respect, was part of the problem. He was a neoliberalist, and um, and, and uh, he was the one, NAFTA was approved under Bill Clinton, and uh, he was the one responsible primarily, or, or it was under his uh, term that uh, they actually had a, uh, a, a uh, reintegration of finance capital and commercial banks. They created the financial crisis of, the, of 2008. Um, so neoliberalist global policy integrating commercial banks and investment banking led to the 2008 global financial crisis. So what happened then after that? Uh, in the crisis of 2008, 5.5 million manufacturing jobs were lost. Uh, 10, million, 10 trillion dollars of losses in real estate foreclosures of homes and retirement savings. 648 billion in lost income due to slow economic growth. And we continue to have very low economic growth. This last year it was 1.8%. Trump says he's gonna take it up to 4%. Nobody knows how he's gonna do that. Even the capitalist class doesn't understand how he's gonna be able to manage that. Wages were cut or remained stagnant. Huge increases in income and wealth inequality. 10% now own 76% of all the wealth in this country. Huge increases in inequality. So what was the effect of this uh, economic uh, financial crisis uh, and, the economic, and the economic crisis? Current global political crisis of the capitalist state. So now this economic crisis has turned into a global political crisis. I think it was mentioned earlier that this, uh, what we're dealing with here in this country under Trump is a global phenomenon, it's not just a national phenomenon. So now we have political instability in the major capitalist countries. Now we have the exit of the UK from the European Union over much the same issues. Constitutional changes in Italy to try and address some of these things were rejected. The rights of the ultra-right nationalists and neo-fascists in Europe, across Europe, they're pretty close to winning and they lost in Austria just by a hair. And now there's potential that uh, Marie Le Pen is going to win in France and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the other part of the political crisis faced by the, by the U.S. capitalist state is Bernie Sanders' uh, populist uh, political campaign. 13 million voted for a self-described socialist. That was huge with a very good program. And um, that scared the hell out of the US you know, class. Trump then became elected president of the USA. This was not, ex not only unexpected by many of us, it was not even expected by the ruling class. They came to, as a shock to them. So what now? So many political differences exist between the Republican establishment and the, the ruling class in general and Donald Trump. Um, and I think we need to emphasize this. We're, we're, we're missing that part of the, of the equation. The ruling class by and large in this country is anti-Trump, okay? So you must consider that when you consider the potential for this administration turned into out and out fascism. But the ruling class, although it faces this political 
crisis and an economic crisis still doesn't face the crisis that other fascist states had before. If you look at the crisis that Germany faced in the 1930s, when Hitler came into power, it faced a massive economic problems from the Depression, massive problems from the First World War, and a very significant threat from the social from socialists. Communists and social democrats had more than 50% of all the votes in Germany at the time. So they faced the left threat, and this, in fact, for the capitalist state, there was one way to address this. And that's fascism is, is using a militaristic, open, dictatorial, uh, brutal uh, system of, of rule. The ruling class, capitalist ruling class, does not prefer fascism. They don't like it, they don't want it, it's too unstable. And it's not, and as you can see from what's happened to fascist countries around the world, okay? They don't like it. Capitalism prefers bourgeois democracy, the appearance of democracy, the semblance of democracy. They prefer that. That is the best form of, of the state for capitalism. So the, the same thing goes on right now today. The, the capitalist class, by and large, is opposed to fascism in this country. And uh, so that opens up a lot of opportunities for us to work with that sector uh, in addition to working with a broad, broader sector of labor and the mass movement, not only to stop any efforts at, at introducing fascist measures, but also to think ahead when Trump's no longer here. And he may be gone sooner than we think. And what's going to happen after that? What's going to happen to neoliberalism after Trump is left? We're going to go back to business as usual. If we do, we're going to be in worse shape the next time. Something better than Trump is going to come around, smarter. And they're going to take lessons from what happened to Trump. But there are some contradictions now within the ruling class. Uh, uh, some establishment Republicans, or many establishment Republicans, and corporations are salivated at lower corporate taxes. Trump says he's going to lower the corporate taxes a lot, from a, a, what, about 37% or so down to 15%, uh, percent, 20%, depends what you talk to and what day of the day of the week it is. Um, they're definitely adamant they want to eliminate Obamacare. Uh, they want less corporate regulations. So extreme right Republicans are very strong and active at a state level. So that is that is a significant danger at the state level. There's massive popular demonstrations of resistance now. And uh, so when the uh, League of Women Voters and the Democratic Party in Texas, a red state, are calling for street demonstrations, something fundamentally different has happened. Something has happened. And the Women's March certainly happened. And in Houston, Texas, but the largest demonstration we ever had, about a thousand people opposing this uh, or calling for comprehensive immigration reform. During this women's march in Houston, Texas, had over 23,000 people showing up in the streets. The most, the largest demonstration in the history of Houston, Texas, which is the what, fourth largest city in the country, third largest county in the country, and um, so this is a change. We have to take advantage of this this, this movement, uh, starting to, to grow it and, and so forth. Um, what are other additional major contradictions and challenges? Reckless foreign adventurism threatens global peace, nuclear proliferation, People's Democratic Republic of Korea. What's going to happen there? Trump talks about a surprise retaliation against uh, North Korea. Uh, Taiwan, I think he's backed off away from Taiwan for now. Who knows if it's going to come up again? That is a really bad sore point with China, with the one China policy. They're willing to go to war over Taiwan and the South China Sea, right, just because of their history. Uh, we also have potential problems in the Middle East. Russia baiting is, in my opinion, certainly is, is counterproductive and a threat to world peace also. 
I know that there's a lot of focus, certainly in the Democratic Party and some sectors of the Republican Party, to use uh, Russia baiting to get Trump and, and impeach him, but this is a double-edged sword. You have to be very careful with that one. Another potential global financial meltdown in Bela, that may result if, we, if, if some of this deregulation does take place and there's a sector that's willing to work with Trump for this deregulation again, if, if, the, if some of that occurs in the financial business again, it can create another massive global financial crisis. So what are some of the other major areas uh, of ruling class division? Uh, Attacks on bourgeois democracy in the judiciary, that does create divisions in, in, the, in the ruling class. Uh, potential international trade wars, that is, border, you know, almost all the ruling class in this country, including the corporations, are against the border adjustment tax. It's going to start a, uh, a major uh, war on trade. Infrastructure jobs bill, Trump's calling for that. I think he's giving a lip service, though, but the Republicans oppose it. They've always been opposed to uh, any kind of uh, uh, fiscal stimulus using uh, using uh, infrastructure jobs. Funding is also a, a divided issue. How is it going to be funded? Attacks on the credibility of the bourgeois media is a big, big one. Right now, the majority of the bourgeois media is anti-Trump. And he's, he's attacking it viciously because he called it fake news. This certainly is an opportunity for us because, in fact, Bourgeois media is fake news. It's not the type of fake news that you saw in social media, but it is fake news. So we have to take advantage of that, you know. Uh, uh, but for now, this fake news is attacking Trump, so that's, that's good. Open uh, racism, misogyny, mis discrimination against immigrants and Muslims, that doesn't carry very well with the majority of the ruling class. It's, it's creating a, a very bad image for the United States abroad. And it's creating troubles in the Middle East. So. Uh, deviations from the Washington consensus on foreign affairs. This is a big one. The ruling class has a Washington consensus. And Trump is messing with it. Uh, that's on the issue of Russia. Taiwan, South Korea, I mean, South China Sea, NATO, NAFTA, relations with allied countries, and the U.S. intelligence uh, services. So some opportunities create splits between Trump, Republicans, and Trump supporters. Uh, increasing working class consciousness and socialist consciousness during this crisis of confidence in the ruling class parties that does occur right now. Millions of people are questioning everything. There is a new openness to socialism. For increasing the size and unity of the mass popular front movement, we spoke about that earlier. Other opportunities, defeating Republicans in 2018 and defeating Trump in 2020. Elect more progressives in 2018 and 2020. Building massive resistance fused with radical anti-racism. We talked about the importance of, of connecting those, those two issues because they are connected. To increase the size, influence, and working unity of the left. Let's think about that. You know, this is an opportunity to work a uh, unity of the left in action. To build the CPUSA is an indispensable requirement for the next stage of the struggle of the political revolution. So we have to build a party in this period. If we don't build in this period, I'm not sure when we're going to build it. We must go on the offensive, demanding bold, distinct working class solutions. So we're not just playing defense, we have to play, uh, play offense. That we, the culprit of this, we have to. Stated very clearly that the culprit for the current state of affairs, economically and politically, is capitalism. The solution is socialism, majority rule, the working class in full power, the full realization of democracy. Socialism is really power to the people. Um, and the rest of it is on, on the role of the CPUSA. We'll talk a little bit more about that late, later on when we talk about extending the influence uh, of the uh, CPUSA. So hopefully this gives you some food for thought uh, as we continue the discussion on challenges and opportunities, and uh, when I hear your contributions.